Welcome. I'm Paul McLennan, MSP for East Lothian and a member of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee. And I'd like to welcome an edition of the Festival of Politics 2021 partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Futures Forum. This afternoon's panel is titled Safe City, Spaces for Everyone, and is held in partnership with the Scottish Youth Parliament. We are delighted that so many people are here able to join us online today, and I look forward to hearing comments and questions from you as we get into our discussions. So, how do we make our cities safe and inclusive for everyone? How do we banish the fear of leaving the house, especially after dark? And how do we address the fact that male dominated areas of urban planning and transport are not as diverse as the communities they serve? Can more thoughtful and inclusive urban design create well lit, multi gender, and multi generational open gathering spaces where everyone feels visible and welcome? This panel aims to address all of these questions in the next 60 minutes or so, so please stay with us. We are delighted that you are able to join the event to take this part, and I would encourage you all to use the event chat function, stating your name and geographical location, and pose any questions you would like the panel to respond to. I am very pleased um, to be invited by our three panellists. First, we have Sophie Reid, member of the, the Scottish Youth Parliament, um, Alex Botterill, Programme Lead on Livable Cities and Towns from Sustrans, and Dr Ellie Cosgrave, the Associate Professor of Urban Innovation at University College London. Welcome all. There will be an opportunity for our online audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. If you would like to make a contribution, please enter them into the question and answer box that you see. Make sure to state your first name and where you are from this afternoon, and we will get through as many as possible. However, I would like to begin by asking each of our panellists, how safe do you feel walking about your respective cities at different times of the day and night? I would like first to come to Alex Bottrell, then Sophie, then Dr Riley Cosgrave. Alex. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. So, How safe do I feel walking around uh, at different times of the day? Um, I would say I do feel safe walking around my city um, at all hours of the day, really. Uh, I'm now based in Bristol, but um, moved down here back from Edinburgh about four years ago, and I lived there for about six years. Um, I did feel very much uh, safe uh, in Edinburgh as well, and you know it's one of those places with lots of windows looking onto the street that kind of make you feel um, very welcome in in the, the sort of older city. Um, however, I would say that as a gay man, um, and also somebody who's perhaps not judged or assumed to be gay. Um, I would say that I don't seek to advertise openly that I am gay, um, and therefore, I, I suppose, in a moment of honesty, that's because there's there's a sort of a slight underlying fear about that, um, especially if I see a kind of a boisterous group of of men, perhaps. Um, so I'm aware that uh, while I do feel safe, I'm, I'm not entirely able to be um, truly myself um, all of the time. Uh, but it's it's such a, a sort of subtle thing for me. Um, it's very much in the background, but I think for some people this is uh, perhaps more of a concern than it is for me. Yeah, Alex, thank you very much for that. And obviously, in the back of the Sarah Everard cases, that we just in the case that we've just seen in the last few um, months as well, you know, it, it's very, very relevant. I'm going to now come across to Sophie. Sophie, yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, personally, as a teenage girl in Glasgow in Scotland, um, I don't always feel safe walking around my city. Um, during the day, I do feel more safe, but I have been a victim of sexual harassment during the day as well as at night. Um, so it's not always a safe environment. Um, I do feel more unsafe at night times, especially when it's dark um, and coming into winter months. This is more of a concern, um, and that has been heightened off the back of the Sarah Everard um, cases that you're mentioning. Um, I think this is a shared experience among teenage girls. Um, Girl Guide in Scotland's 2020 Girls in Scotland report showed that 56% of girls feel worried when outside and it's dark. And 53% said more should be done so that girls and young women feel safe in their local area. 
Um, it's such a prominent issue in the media, but more needs to be done to actually tackle it. Sophie, thank you for that. And I know it's a, it's obviously a, a really important issue in the Parliament just now as well. And this is about men having to change their attitude as well. You know, and, and I think that's one of the most important things. So, you know, from from a young teenage girl and putting your views across, and obviously hearing from Alex as well, you know, it becomes across very, very important. Um, Ellie, I'm going to come across to yourself just now. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you both for sharing, you know, personal aspects of your lives. I think that's a really um, uh, important to show that this is a really human issue. That, um, and I know also it takes courage to talk about those things. So I'm really grateful to both of you for sharing. I um, I study violence against women in public space um, as my job, and so in many ways I am mentally preoccupied with violence against women in my everyday life. And for me, that, in fact, uh, I think contributes to my feeling, my lack of feeling of safety in public space, because I am aware of the stories and the truth of violence against women that happens uh, all the time. Uh, and what I think that, what I think is important about that is that we all, women especially, and marginalized groups do, have, um, all have stories or experiences of sexual violence and harassment. And so we bring those stories to anywhere we are, where, where, whether or not the place is safe in terms of the crime statistics in any given area. So it's important that we think or that we understand women's experience of public space as being situated or entwined with our histories and the stories uh, that we see in the media, that we see kind of fetishized in TV programs and films um, that affect our sense of do we belong in that space. And that's something certainly that I feel uh, makes me feel more precarious in public space, whether or not the crime statistics bear those, those feelings of safety out. During the pandemic, I have become a cyclist. <laughs> And that has been actually a wonderful experience for me in terms of my personal sense of safety. The fact that I can get from door to door under my own physical steam, which gives me a sense of power. It gives me a sense that um, I am more, I'm less vulnerable uh, walking down the street. I feel much less vulnerable with uh, a, a, a bike, knowing that I can powerfully cycle away. Um, but uh sometimes google maps takes me on dodgy routes or routes that i feel are dodgy so just yesterday i was passing through uh a, i was directed it was a cycle route but it was a very small alleyway for quite long and i and it was just getting dark and i thought ah no and i can't really turn around so i think the the kind of overlaying of digital technologies and making sure that we understand what safety means for cyclists and pedestrians beyond um, simply not being next to cars, um, but making sure that we have activated spaces as well. Um, on the note of cycling, I yesterday was uh, was cycling home from an evening uh, on on pretty much the exact route that Sarah Everard was walking home when she was abducted, and so when and I go to that place uh, that I was visiting a lot and I think about her a lot and I think about the stories and I and I wonder you know I know where she walked um, and it's those kind of traces of history of violence that are alive in my mind and my imagination and that remind me that I'm not safe and and so that's something that you know we have to understand that these stories are situated in places and in in how do we acknowledge that in, in our built environment design, I think is an interesting question. Yeah. Hey, Ellie, thank you for that. And and I think you know, just your recollection when you mentioned it about Sarah Everard and, and actually walking the route and, and, and it and it's real. You know, we've we've all heard what has impacted on, on all of us, but actually hearing, you know, that you, you've walked the route and the impact it has on yourself makes it even more real for, for people. So thank you for very much for sharing that 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 with us. And I think just in hearing you know the, the three recollections A and O from yourself and walking the route from from 
from Alex and seeing uh, coming across from as a gay man, and obviously coming across from Sophie as as, as a young teenage girl as well. You know, this really brings the subject home, and and how really important th this is. So thank you very much, to all three of you, for for sharing that. Um, I want to try and open up now a little bit more and, and, and examine the subject in a little more more, more detail. And I suppose one of the key things is and is name the city that epitomises the safe city and inclusive space and explain why they've got it right for women, children, teenagers, older people, and those with accessibility requirements. Now, I wouldn't imagine there's one city that's got all, but in your own experiences, who would you say has the best? And the, Ellie, I'll probably come to yourself first of all, and then Sophie, and then Alex. Well, honestly, I think it's all to play for, is my answer, in terms of the city that is going to do it well. I get asked all the time, what are the examples who like show us how to do this well? Where's already smashed it? And actually, the truthful, the biggest truthful answer I, I always give back is, looks like it's got to be you. <laughs> um, however, we do know some of the things that really work. Um, I don't know if I'm stealing other people's examples. If I if I swoop to Vienna, because Vienna is is an example of a city who's been doing this work for a really long time, since the early 90s, has instigated um, uh, action of gender mainstreaming into all public space design. They have a strategy for it, and they have a long-term commitment to it. One of the examples that um, I give often about the design of public spaces is that what they were able to do in Vienna was to really identify some key areas that they have power to invest in, um, and do some proper grounded research uh, in the gendered use of space. Uh, they um, looked particularly at their public parks, and what they found from the research and from kind of auditing who is using that space, that by age eight, uh, the, uh, until the age of eight, boys and girls are using the space kind kind of equally, and then something happens at age eight that means that the use of the public parks by girls and women just completely drops off. And so what they decided to do was to create different areas of the park to see what, uh, to, to enable different types of uses. So there were particular areas where you could play certain types of sports and different areas um, that, would, that were cordoned off for children, different areas to sit and talk, um, areas that would be pleasant for walking. And once the space is physically delineated, they found that girls started using the space again. And the message that came out of that was that uh, when, you have, when you have to socially negotiate the use of space, men win, boys win. <laughs> um, and so what you need to do is make sure, and this is not because like men are trying to take up lots of space is because the that is how society has enabled what society has enabled that things like football can easily get bigger and bigger and take up more and more space and um not to say that girls don't don't want to and shouldn't be playing football but it tends to be uh anyway <laughs> you need to create different space for different types of activities. Um, and so, really, there's all sorts of ways we can apply that type of learning to understand the gendered nature of any city. And um, by that type of learning, I mean collecting gender disaggregated data about use of space, how people feel in different, uh, in, in different areas. Lighting schemes are super important, but they can't just be add more lights. Um, because that has a, a huge effect in what, if you like the main streets, secondary streets feel darker. Yeah, yeah, Ellie, just just on that point, and sorry, to, you, you obviously mentioned that in the collecting that data, how do you think in, in this regard, you know, because again, if you're saying the data has got collected, how well do cities do that at the moment? Is that a piece of work that needs to be carried out by most cities and, and most most countries at this stage? Yeah, I think uh, there's, there's, cities collect an awful lot of data, but the gender question, the gender data, it, it is just often it's it's not gender disaggregated. So we don't nece can't necessarily tell um, for who is the city working and for who is it not. However, I don't think we can. I, I think there is something that we can learn from Vienna in our own cities without having to 
do the hard graft of um, of collecting all the data because we know we we there are certain things that we we know from theory and we know from other cities are just true and that we can then apply so I wouldn't want to say we have to wait five or ten years until we've got really good data before we start designing good parks you know we know the principles of that sometimes it can be really good for making the case to funding bodies um, and sometimes though we're going to have super interesting insights I've just done a project where we've been looking at how domestic workers get to work um, and some of the barriers for them in in London, um, Karachi and Cape Town. Um, so we're, we're looking for principles about um, like uh, what are the barriers to safe mobility in cities, which can then be applied to other places. Um, but there is a huge opportunity, I think, for making um, making visible women's experiences through gender disaggregated data. Ellie, thank you for that. Sophie, I'll come across to yourself with the same question. I think um, off the back of what Ellie was discussing about parks specifically, um, I automatically thought of the opposite answer of this question, a negative example, um, which was Festival Park in Glasgow. Um, there was an artwork, kind of crude, um, artwork of a woman's legs spread on the gates to the park, very close to the locations of where sexual assaults had taken place. Um, and I think that's the result of young people and women being left out of the conversation, being, out, being left out of city planning and designing urban spaces. And obviously, I think we'll go more into the barriers to that happening later. Um, but I think that the prime example shown how we have to change. Um, I think I can't think of a place to answer this question that does it perfectly right. I don't think that exists, um, especially across Scotland. There's still steps needing to be taken to improve safety for women and girls, accessibility for people with disabilities, and to tackle issues such as racism and discrimination against the LGBTQ plus community, um, which continue to make communities feel unsafe. So I don't think anyone's got it perfectly right yet, um, but I think we need to keep on learning and taking positive examples and continue to work on them. Sophie, thank you for that. And, and I think the case you mentioned obviously was covered quite well in the press as well and, and was staggering when you actually see work that I'm losing that loop that was referred to. It, it was staggering that, that we even have to that we even have to, you know, that's seen as acceptable. So yeah, quite agree on that one. Sophie, thank you for that. I'm going to come across to Alex. Alex, same question. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Sophie, I couldn't agree with you more. Nobody's got it right yet. And Ellie, to your explanation, I think you used the word something along the lines of um, it, it's got to be you. You know, I, I took that to mean everyone needs to try and do better. Uh, and let's take it as a personal responsibility in our roles and our, our opportunities to influence to try and do better. Um, so this is not a perfect example by any means. And I can I can sort of be quite open about one of the the areas where I think this place falls down. But uh, one place that I, I do think there's, there's a lot of good to look at is Copenhagen. Um, one example I've got, um, it kind of relates to, to some of the points, Ellie, you were making about um, about the way places are defined, although perhaps less directly. Um, but it does this thing of delighting people. Um, so I, I was walking along one day and saw this really pristine looking grass by the side of a um, a public space and I thought oh that looks nice then I saw a sign and my expectation my prejudgment is that the sign is going to say keep off the grass and as I got closer to it I realized that the sign actually said on it you are welcome to come and sit on the grass and it's a really tiny example um, of perhaps a silly thing but to me it shows a completely different mindset how people think about cities as kind of welcoming um, perhaps empathetic spaces rather than prohibitive um, spaces and I think it just sums up, and like I say, Copenhagen is not perfect, but it sums up some of the delight that you get from a city like that. And that's followed through, obviously, you know, coming from a, a sus trans perspective. Um, they do a lot well in terms of transport and mobility for everyone. They get a lot of people walking and cycling very easily. Uh, and it's having those people right on the street rather than driving along in 
metal and glass boxes who are actually disconnected from the spaces that they're going through. I think actually physically having people um, on the street really makes a difference. And in cities like Edinburgh with the streets, uh, spaces for people projects and, and Glasgow as well, um, you know, that's going in the right direction too. So some really big wins for Scotland on the way um, and, and already happening. Um, but yeah, the, the, the sort of the egalitarian nature of the, the Danish state as well, I think also contributes to a, a kind of safer and a kind of more caring place to be. So it's got to kind of work at all levels, um, I think. I've, I've got to say alongside that though, I think where perhaps Copenhagen might fall down in comparison to some of the um, some other places is perhaps with, with accessibility. Um, I don't know if it says, I'm speaking not as a disabled person, um, so I'd be interested to know the lived experience of people um, who have been there. Um, but yeah, my perception is it's not as disability or accessibility friendly as some other cities. So that's, it's not getting it perfect, but, but yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. And I just want to move on to another subject just now, but just on, on the terms of that, um, I've got one question that just kind of come in just now, and we're asking around about site planners thinking about bus stop location and frequency. I don't know what your recollection is or what your views are on that at, at the moment. We'll move on to more open questions in a second, but Moira's raised that point at the moment around that about. You kind of touched on that a little bit and talking around about accessibility and uh, as well, or, or you know, people with uh, uh, site issues, for example. Are you aware of, of, of that, uh, uh, generally speaking, about how city planners look at that, that issue? And, and I've, so, Alex, can I come to yourself first of all, and I'll go to Ellie and then Sophie after that? Yeah, sure. Um, I think there's a recognition that the um, some of the solutions, particularly um, with cycling and bus stops and disabled people, um, aren't aren't there yet you know there's still um uh, a gap between um the engagement that needs to happen uh, a, a broader conversation um and a better understanding from absolutely every street user uh, about what's involved and i think kind of related to to ellie's point on data um, disaggregation we need to actually have more evidence to support different types of um, different types of design, or not to support, but to, to kind of make sense of different types of design. Um, I suppose while there might be perceptions of winners and losers in, in current um, uh, specific locations, I suppose overall, I, you know, it, it pains me to, to say this because I know some people won't, won't see it this way, but it's good to have those examples so that we can be looking at what is working and what's not and trying to understand better why. Um, but I think everyone involved and us as such trans certainly play a part in this. We need to remain absolutely open minded to learn from um, the lived experience of all people um, who are negatively impacted by some of the cycling um, solutions um, for things like bus stops. Alex, thank you for that. I'll, I'll go across to Ellie just now. Ellie, Ellie, obviously, you touched on that about the data collection, and I think that's a very yeah. Amendment was raised around about that, and how do then how does that then inform decisions? I don't know if you want to comment on that specific point that, that Moira made. Uh, yes, I think um, understanding what a safe city is from a gender perspective ha helps us to think about the city as um, a place with multiple experience and where people have multiple needs, um, and a sort of corollary of that, or something that follows on from that, is that. Um, yes, when we think about sort of gendered needs, <laughs> ramps are really important, toilets are really important, and where we, what we start to find is that actually that those sorts of things are, are just about making a city accessible generally. Um, I think there is more work that needs to be done with physical um, disability, but also neurodiversity, and there is quite a lot of work being done at UCL um, around um, Alzheimer's. Uh, in public space, how, do, how can we create spaces that are navigable if you don't know where you are? Um, autis, autism and like loud, la, uh, loud noises and how to create safe spaces for, for people who, who have uh, particular cognitive needs. And so like, this is an, an, like, a huge inquiry, but at the basis, it's about understanding that our physical infrastructure design has different impacts and different value and based on who you are. So we need, when we are 
creating our investment decisions to be able to say, okay, so who does that create value for and how? And how can we balance our investments such that we bring everyone up to a basic standard of living and therefore justify some really intense spending on some of the most vulnerable and excluded groups so that we can live in a society that we think is just and fair. Um, I was very excited and moved to be um, part of a research project called Choreographing the City, where we worked with dance artists to explore move, um, how we move through the city, simply because they have a very, uh, dance artists have a very particular view on how, our movement and a very specific, particular expertise. And I was very moved to be on a panel there with a disabled, a physically disabled dance artist who had no, who was in a wheelchair, and he spoke very eloquently about how he was moved by the city and had very limited choices. Um, and so I think if we can bring in the um, acknowledge that disabled people, or you know, all pe all people and marginalised people also have a talent and a um, uh, a an ability to express themselves an expertise that it can be super valuable and we need to give away give some power as um, urban designers and people with uh, uh, expertise and yeah and power to make decisions about our urban realm to people who are experts in a in a way that we are not yeah and, and I think earlier Sophie I'll come across to yourself just now and We've had Kimberly from Glasgow making the point there was some research carried out by you in Glasgow and and found about social identity massively impacted on women and and, and non-binary people and and how safe they felt on in, in the buses using the buses in Glasgow and in fact I said the vast majority of women didn't feel safe at, at night time so we see how important that that policy making is at, at, at that time Sophie I'm going to come on to yourself and, and I know we've got some other questions some other comments in the back of that and I'm keen to move on but Sophie just on that point we talked around about at the start um, public transport and sexual harassment on public transport are big passions of mine to tackle um, I propose a motion at SYP that passed with 96 percent on um, taking action to prevent sexual harassment from occurring on public transport and seeing decision makers and service providers reviewing their policies to ensure that systems are in place to help young people feel safe when traveling. I think the Young Women Lead research that you pointed out is really interesting. I would recommend having a look at this uh, that after the session. Um, for SIP's own campaign, All Aboard, which was specifically about um, public transport, we found that just over one in five of female respondents said they do not feel confident travelling alone um, on public transport compared to less than one in ten male respondents. So you can see there's a big gender gap within that. Um, and the timing and availability of public transport is also a challenge for some young people. Uh, we had a 17 year old girl say she finished work at half eight. But the next bus home wasn't until half ten, meaning she would have to walk home along a dark track after midnight. Um, so there, there is kind of the inequalities within our transport system. I think there's also inequalities when we look at disability. Um, the same all aboard research found that nearly two thirds of young people who have a disability do not feel comfortable using public transport. And some specifically mentioned difficulties they've faced when pushchairs, um, when using pushchairs or other passengers, and um, being in accessible seats, um, and also facing discrimination and stigma from staff. Um, these are all massive issues and inequalities that still need to be dealt with within the transport um, sector. And I think that a lot of work needs to be done to improve that. Yeah, Sophie, thank you for that. And I was going to take this question later on, but it's kind of doing some of the discussions. And Kimberly from from Glasgow had kind of said about the point she'd made around about the, the research that had been carried out. But her ultimate question was, who's responsible for women's safety and needs that are built into town planning? And I'm going to I'll ask that question. But the, the key thing then is, and I think this is an important context: are all local councils across the UK prioritising these changes as fundamental as to say? For example, climate change. So, how seriously are local authorities taking the point that Kimberley raises? 
So uh, again, I'll probably come back to yourself, Ellie, then go to Sophie, and then to, to Alex. And, and I think that's a really important point. Yeah, it's it's. So Ellie, well. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is at, um, absolutely core to how to, how we start to make progress in this area. My answer will always be: it is all of our responsibility to find where our power is and work together to create a comprehensive plan and action. Some of us have more power than others. Uh, we have to acknowledge that. But I guess um, some of my criticism and um, disappointment, I guess, in in some of the res funding responses that we've had uh, in light of Sarah Everard's abduction, uh, which focus on policing and CCTV as um, the solution um, and a kind of pr prioritizing a policing and crime approach. Um, shows to me that uh, <laughs> I don't know how direct to be, but I'll just go for it. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, that the cabinet office doesn't understand the reality of violence against women um, because the policing system doesn't actually uh, it, uh, it it is not a criminal offence to um, Harass a, harass a woman in, in many ways. Like it's not a criminal offence to shout at a woman in the street. It's not even illegal to follow her home. Um, and so, a, a, and on top of that, as I said before, it is not the actual crime against women, the uh, the, the crime rates that uh, we are scared of. It is uh, the 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 knowledge of our vulnerability because we present as female. And so, in order to um, to create strategies that do work, my view is that we need to be carrying out women's safety audits where we work with women in local communities who uh, have lived experience of the place and can tell us, whoever us is, who can, who can vocalize and uh, the specific needs, the specific areas they feel particularly vulnerable and why, what their safety behaviors are and why and the people that should be alongside and listening are transport authorities who maybe have uh, bus networks that they can re rethink of a bus as a safe place, um, local businesses who have, often can create um, the first response. What, is, what does it mean to be um, a, a good high street? <laughs> um, uh, uh, local authorities, schools, to, create, uh, to work together to create a holistic plan and strategy with people with different responsibilities that you can see how you fit into a larger story. In London, we have the Women's Night Safety Charter where nighttime venues have signed up to, or are committed to action to support women's safety at night. So uh, if we can invest, and police should be there too, I'm not anti-police, but like there, there, there is a purpose for police in women's safety, but when we only say that it's a police and crime response, then we're we're completely lost, I believe. And so if we can get together to have genuinely nuanced conversations about uh, the diversity of safety experiences and needs in a particular space, and we can get creative about what our individual um, power and responsibility and ability is to act, uh, we can create a movement that is becomes a strategy and that we're actually accountable to. Um, and so I and so I hope that's what people will start to doing be doing. I've applied for some funding for it, but let's yeah, see. Ellie, th thank you for that. And and you know I, I think we'll touch on it. There's, there are wider general gender inequality issues here and a much, much bigger subject as you said and and it requires a mind change, you know, particularly from from, from men. And I'm, you know, and then policy. Come on to yourself, and then, and then on to to Alex. Just on again on the, on the same issue that was mentioned there. Yeah, I think that um the point that you just raised there, and um, that a lot of the responsibility is on women to make these changes. Um, when it it needs to be turned away, we are not the ones that are perpetrating this violence against women. Um, so the responsibility should be on men to change behaviours and attitudes. Um, but I think when kind of looking at city planning, um, that every 
like decision makers and everyone involved has a responsibility to make sure they are consulting people who will be using the city, not just those people who are perhaps easy to consult with. Um, I think that can happen quite a lot. Um, it's groups of people who are um, responding a lot to things and you miss out a lot of seldom heard groups um, when consulting. Um, and I think that we need to make these systems more accessible to young people, to women, to, to different um, minority groups, so that you actually have a diverse picture in the research that then can be actioned on. Sophie, thank you for, for that. And, and Alex, yourself? Thank you. Um, I don't really have that much to add to that, to be honest. I think you've both put it so well. Um, the only thing um, I, I was going to sort of draw upon is, um, I mean, we've seen some atrocious examples in politics, thinking of Donald Trump with his locker room talk. Um, and uh, as a gay man, I think um, the gay community, gay men have a unique opportunity, actually, to hear about women's issues and see it from both sides. I think there is a, maybe this is stereotyping, I don't know, but I think there is a natural uh, link between feminism and gay men. Um, I'm, I go into a, a male locker room and I hear what people say. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think um, we have a, a, no more responsibility than anyone else, but an opportunity perhaps to, to, to challenge or to take some of the things we hear. And, and, and ultimately, I think what needs to happen is um, we need to, to do what we can to grow empathy in the right direction. I think there's so much empathy between women and perhaps between the gay community and women. Um, gay male community, uh, particularly um, from my perspective. Um, but I think we need to work harder to, to get that empathy grown to a broader um, spectrum of society. And just to put this into a slightly different context, um, I was lucky enough to do some disability awareness training recently. Well, uh, actually ages ago, before COVID, but that's a time warp, isn't it? Um, and we uh, we went on electric scooter, uh, sorry, electric wheelchairs and push wheelchairs, and we had um, blindfolds, and we actually went around the streets and put ourselves in the position of, of people with disabilities, and it was profound. Um, we noticed police cars parked on the pavement. We noticed bins blocking the way. Um, we noticed the alternative is to go into a busy highway. Um, if we can generate the same kind of empathy. Um, for these issues that that generated for, for me and the design team at Sustrans that, that took part in that session. Um, I think that is definitely part of the solution. Alex, thank you for that. I've got a couple of comments that have come in just during uh, as we've been talking here. And Ellie, the first one's probably just for yourself, and it was specifically on the comment you made regarding public spaces. And one was asking around about how do we strike a balance between encouraging people to use the spaces, but potentially we mentioned obviously as well is, is, is trying to avoid segregation. You know, as you said, I think you mentioned that it's usually boys and men that take over that that space. It, it, what ways can we try and was manipulate and use, and, and how can we try and you, you know encourage that that use without segregating the area? And that's probably the first question for yourself. The second question, and I'll open it up and give everybody an opportunity to think about it. Was and this is Harriet Kim that's asking around about this, um, mentioning around about. We've we've had a built environment that's been designed in many cities over a long number of years, and maybe what we're doing at the moment is trying to redesign that or add the opportunity to completely redesign, I suppose, transport links and, and cross suburb links in, in other parts of cities. So not just building on, but completely rejigging and, and looking at where we are to, to ensure that people can in, in, uh, travel safely and so on. So, Ellie, the first point around about the public parks. Then I'll come back to yourself around about the, the built environment and do we change that and then open that up after that, yeah, if that's okay. So it's specifically on the public parks point to yourself, first of all. Great, thank you. I think that's a really good point. Um, my view is that when we're thinking about creating public space, we should always be thinking about opening up opportunities for multiple, from for opening up opportunities rather than closing them down. So in fact, by creating um, just a cordoned off spaces, they don't say uh, boy space, girl space. <laughs> what they say is uh, this type of activity, that type of activity. And um, in some senses, we think that barriers are, that many times we assume a barrier is about excluding, whereas actually sometimes it can be about um, curating. And um, so we have a football pitch or some kind of sports pitch 
which we have a sense may be predominantly used by males. So what do we do about uh, layering on social infrastructure and, and projects and programs that open up that space? Um, and so it's not just the physical infrastructure that we need to think about in terms of curating, but we need to think about like how we as a society then mold and use. Um, my view of the public park creating different zones is about opening up rather than segregating. Um, the, men like to go on nice walks in nature too, or sit and talk to their friends. So um, more thinking, like we have to think about the multiple types of uses um, and then make sure that we're creating safe spaces for them. But I Nearly do take the point. That might turn into like boys over here. And that there. question was from Audrey Nicol, who I think maybe maybe one of my MSP colleagues in the Parliament. So thanks to Audrey for, for that. And the, the second question, Ellie, and I'll stick with yourself obviously is from I think it's I, I mean it's it's Harriet uh, mentioning in the bit obviously the built environment and it's rather than just changing the built environment can we completely amend what we we're doing in our cities just now and, and create I suppose new opportunities, new apps, new systems that can respond to where we are now rather than where the design systems that they were built 40, 50, 60 years ago. Yeah, um, if I understand yeah. the question correctly, you could, uh, I'll answer what I think the question is. Um, I think there's a, there's, there's, yes, we, when we have the opportunities to do big infrastructure redevelopments, we need to make sure we're ready to go with what, how it needs to work. We need to understand our community, the needs of our communities, who we're serving, and have a gender and disability and racial lens on those. However, they, those opportunities doesn't, don't necessarily come around so often. And so we need to think about the ways as a society that we can um, create some sort of unity culture and standard about how we uh, treat each other in public space. And so a big dreamy investment for me, from my point of view that would make a massive difference to people's feeling of safety in public space would be a huge push and a social conversation and an advertising campaign on bystander intervention training. We know how to uh, how bystanders can safely intervene when they notice or see any kind of harassment. We know the types of activities. We know what makes people who've experienced any kind of violence in public space feel better, even after the event, if it was awful. It just, you know. There are all sorts of things that we know. If you go down to Hollaback, Google Hollaback by five Ds of bystander intervention training, we know what works to create cultures, to create safe spaces for, for women. Um, and so I would say, let everyone know that <laughs> and get people talking about how to safely intervene. I know that some men, especially, uh, for example, my brother-in-law is a big man, um, feel like they will escalate a situation if they intervene and that it can get more violent. So there are other things that they can do, um, uh, but they don't but people don't necessarily know. So I'd say get the five Ds of bystander intervention as a publicly knowledge, like your five a day, <laughs> like just the sort of thing that we know. We eat five portions of fruit and veg a day, and there are five things that we can do if we see harassment in public space, like. Uh, that's where I would go. And there are apps. Ailey, thank, thank you for that. I, I'm conscious of the time I'm going to try and bring in as many people as possible. Alex, just on that point, and Sophie, I don't know if either one of you want to come in on the point that we just raised, and if not, you know, we're going to try and take as many questions, but just on the point that Alex, that, that Ellie talked around about there, about obviously, you know, it's trying to almost not design around about what's there, but an opportunity to create something that's different. I don't know if you want to briefly touch on that. We've got uh, another question after that, and obviously encouraging panellists to come in with other questions at this stage. But Alex and Sophie, do you want to touch on that point at the moment? Uh, yeah, Alex, just, yourself, first of all. Sorry. Sure, yeah, just a really, I suppose, a really quick comment. I think, um, rightly or wrongly, um, we've got to communicate this to the one group of which the element is the, perhaps the, the problem, um, which, which is um, men. Uh, we, need, we need all men to understand this, not because they're all at fault, but because some you know, it's a small contingent. So we need to talk positively um, about uh, and get the messaging right about this, about making places better for everyone. And why wouldn't that be a good thing? Uh, and it's just a really simple message um, that, that 
that is hard to disagree with uh, that, that everyone can, you know, all men should be able to buy into. And then if, if somebody can't, then it's really obvious that they might be the problem. Alex, thank you for that. Sophie, and, and what I'll mention obviously as well, if anybody's got questions, we've got around about 15 minutes left to try and get them in and I'll try and take as many as we possibly can. But again, Sophie, just on, on that question, that previous question. Yeah, um, I think in the ideal world, it would be great if the built environment could adapt quickly to, to the changes in people's lives um, and the way we travel. But I don't know if this is possible um, to you know, overhaul huge infrastructures. I think on the points that Ellie was raising, I think just even opening up conversations. I think on the back of um, Sarah Everard, I've had conversations with male friends um, about things that they can just change to make women feel safer, simply crossing the road or, you know, like there's really simple things that men can do to make women feel more safer. Um, and I think it's about opening up that conversation and, and discussing these things. Um, and I, I really back the idea of a, a campaign and um, what bystanders can do when they do see harassment and sexual harassment happening. I think that's a wonderful idea. No, Sophie, thank you for that. And, and, and this, this probably leads really neatly into our next question. We've got a question from Joanne Binney, and, and Joanne's wondering if any of the panellists have had any thoughts on the current taxi crisis in Glasgow, where at the moment we have a lack of taxi drivers. And this, and, and I think this is UK says where it's almost making it impossible for women to get home safely, particularly in, in the evening. So, are, are there current movements uh, encouraging government intervention to assist us, or what can be done in regards to intervention? Because you know we are now facing, as I said, you know, lack of taxi drivers, and women safely can't get home if there's no transport links, there's no taxi service. You know, we are facing real issues, particularly as we move into this uh, to winter to winter period. So, Sophie, I'll probably come to yourself first of all, then on to Ellie, and then on to Alex. Sophie, and obviously you, you, you probably know the city and are aware of the issues, but, and, um, but you know, if you have any comments on that. Um, yeah, as a young woman who lives in Glasgow, um, this is you know having an effect on many people in my life and myself. Um, our ability to do things, and um, especially in the evenings or at nights, um, there is a huge problem and such a big demand but um lack of service um i think that we need to review our procedures and policies um and something needs to be done quite quickly and interve intervention and um, by decision by decision makers needs to happen um it's having a large effect um on women's ability to be able to get home safely and i'm uh, having to you know change plans or or do things differently um, because of this, and it, it's a safety issue. It leaves um, women stranded in um, dangerous situations, and yeah, I think I'm not aware of any intervention, but uh, I think more needs to be done. Okay, thanks for that, e Ellie. And I don't know if you were aware of the situation in Glasgow or, or in other cities, and if you're aware of there's any other interventions or any other movements that you know that that have. That have sprung up in, in specific, um, you know, and I'd be keen to hear your views on on that point. Yeah, I guess it's it's best for me not to talk too much in this because it's I certainly don't uh, necessarily understand the situation. What I would say is, um, it is it seems important to me to be able to work with uh, to to be able to understand how we finance women's safety, and uh, uh, particularly in relation to mobility and transport. Um, where does the buck stop in terms of investment and how do we make the case for uh, something that we cannot and will not ever be able to quantify in a compelling way because of the nature of violence against women? Uh, this is a huge issue. Like, where do, How do we fi finance a sense of safety for half of the, uh, more than half of the population? And that's that's a question we're going to have to come up with. I, I don't know the answer, but when and where, then when the questions like this come up, we're going to be able to say, okay, this as a society, as a government, or uh, someone with power, is something we're going to prioritise and we're going to invest right now. 
and we can justify we can justify it. at the moment i just think we're we're so blunt in our finance instruments and the way in which we can dis, uh, finance these kinds of health crisis maybe repurposing it as health rather than crime might be a, something don't know but we need to get creative Ellie, thank you for that. Alex, I'll, I'll come across to yourself. We've got another question after this, and then, and then I'd like to move on for closing comments. So, um, yep. Alex, just on the same point that was mentioned there around about the taxi crisis, or if you're aware of issues um, in that regard. I'll admit I'm not very plugged in with what's going on in Glasgow in detail, and I don't think I can pass much comment on on that. But I think, you know, just as as uh, the others were talking, I was just thinking in my head, um, uh, in my life experience, I've had majority male taxi drivers i think i've had two female tra taxi drivers ever so even if there were en enough taxi drivers um that's something for everyone to think about is that taxis themselves might not be considered a safe space um so i think um these these things just need a, a 360 degree look at them um yeah that's it yeah alex thank you for that i've got two questions that have, that have kind of come in so i'll try and take these and if we can answer these very briefly together if that's okay and First one is, is is from Jackie Malcolm, and Jackie's mentioned about obviously the opportunities that, that COVID has probably brought on, and that's particular in about the safe spaces, Alex, we've mentioned in spaces for people. Is there anything we can try and do, obviously, to try and engage that debate with tonight? That's the first question, and I'll you know ask you to. Take that. And I think uh, you know, in in terms of guide to bystander intervention, and said it was very impressive. And I think you know, could panelists provide web pages in in that regard? So probably what I'll come to yourself and, and probably just try and keep your answer very briefly to about a minute each on both these issues, and I'm conscious of the time, and then we'll move on to closing statements. But first one around about what opportunities have we got around about safe spaces and back to COVID, and in terms of useful tips on the Hollaback Guide to Bystander Intervention, if you're aware of that. But Ellie, I'll come to yourself and then to Alex, then to Sophie. So it, it, there is an opportunity, I think. Um, I think that the, it's uh, we've certainly seen cities uh, look to pedestrianisation and increasing uh, cycle lanes um, and uh, allowing road users to take up uh, uh, or non-motorised road users to take up more space. So of course there's an opportunity in there to re rethink. The the barrier is a, a, a it's a perception of um, lack of funding to do so, um, in the in the sense that you've got this paradox of like a great need, but then also people haven't been using transport networks, so a lot of transport networks are really feeling the burn in terms of financial security. So um, there is an opportunity because people are rethinking um, how cities should work and should function and what should be prioritised. Um, but we but it's not really being done with a huge amount of investment in that. It's not like we've got this golden opportunity that's come with a huge financial um, backing. It's it's a it's an opportunity for rethinking that has come out of of closing uh, uh, closing down, which is a bit of a paradox. Um, with respect to the links for bystander intervention, I can probably I can put that in the chat. Yeah, Ellie, thank you for that, uh, Alex. Just on these two points? Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with that point Ellie made about the the um, investment needed. I think the opportunity with COVID has been to see what can be delivered when there's, um, you know, when things align, uh, political will and, you know, obviously a very serious sudden need for some change. Um, but also, you know, the I would say that the, the social benefit of having these spaces not car dominated um, we haven't even got to fully realise what that could do for us as a as a society. Um, I think if these um, if these places were, um, I mean, they've, a lot of these interventions are temporary and they're all for the right reasons. But if they're done in a, a more permanent quality way, um, in line with just, with changes to more home based working, um, which has given opportunity for less traffic on occasions, and I know that hasn't been a constant. We've had situations where it's been worse again. But, but I think we should lead with some ambition on this uh, and try and create the, the sort of healthier streets that we know that, I mean, you know, pollution sits at the level of a two-year-old. You know, you can't say it better than that. 
you know, we need to make these changes. And, and, and even with electric cars, you've got pollutants from brakes and things like that that are, that are breathed in by, by little toddlers. So, yeah, enough said, I think. Yeah, Alex, thank you for that. Sophie, to yourself. Yeah, I think that COVID has opened up quite a lot of conversations um, around safe spaces. Um, one thing on the back of Alex's point is um, the lack of um, ScotRail trains running on Sundays um, and the impacts there for um, climate change. Um, that's leaving a lot of people without access to a main form of public transport. Um, for one of the seven days a week um, and that impact is huge when people are trying to um, be more eco-conscious. I think another conversation that came up during COVID uh, in 2020, sorry, um, although not directly related to COVID, was the issue of systematic racism within statues and street names within our cities. Um, I think that's a for some young black people and people of colour, these statues, plaques and street signs um, are a daily reminder of decades of inequality and the enslavement of their ancestors um, and the inequality that they face day to day. Um, and I think that that issue was widely discussed in 2020 and continues to be, but I think to make our uh, cities safer and more inclusive, we have to look at changing um, things like that. I also think that, um, although not directly related, the Scotland has committed to incorporating the United Nations Conventions of the Rights of a Child, which guarantees um, children and young people the right to have their voices heard. Um, so I think that that will have a huge impact on designing um, urban spaces and making cities safer, and that has to be um, that means that meaningful engagement has to happen with young people on these issues. Okay, thank you for that. And you know, as we're coming towards the close of the event, can I thank? Everybody? I think we could probably look and go on for another two or three hours. Never mind just the hour that we've had, which has passed very quickly. Before we close, I wanted to give each of the panelists one minute just to sum up the issues raised in the discussions and probably look at obviously the barriers and opportunities and probably look around about a minute. Um, if we can keep it to a minute, if that's possible. Um, and I'm going to start, obviously, with Elliot, uh, with Elliot, then to Sophie, and then finally with Alex. Elliot, tears. Okay. <laughs> a minute, please, if you can. <laughs> One minute. Okay, great. I'm already, it's already counting down. <laughs> so I guess what I would say is, um, I will put another link to a resource that I have in the in the in the chat around um, making cities safer for women and girls, particularly focused on London, but the the principles and the philosophies are relevant everywhere. Um, I two calls to action really. If you have been inspired or moved by anything that you've heard today, edu educate yourself about the issues further. Like follow, be curious, follow that inquiry, um, and secondly. Think really deeply about where your power lies for action. What you you have power, and we have to do this as a community. So, what does your power look like? Maybe it looks just like talking to your friends and family, but maybe you have um, a whole community that you can um, that you can work with or mobilise. Um, maybe you have access to finance. Maybe it, the list is endless. I don't know where your power is, but we need people to be very really conscious about. Uh, both understanding the whole issue and knowing what size they're going to um, do that. And I would say partner, partner, partner. Um, I'm here, so you can also reach out to me um, if you need more resources. Yeah, Probably more than a minute. Very much. Yeah, no, it's okay, Sophie, yourself. Um, I think for me, the main important thing in this discussion is that young people have to be meaningfully involved in discussions around city planning, transport and design to help us feel safe and listened to. Um, there's many challenges that young people do face um, in participating, including meetings taking place at times that they're in school or university, um, or when young people have jobs, and young people don't always know how to feed into their views into consultations um, as they don't use accessible language for young people um, or they're not designed in a young friendly manner. 
um, young people want to be asked and listened to, but don't always feel confident stepping forward to participate because they're worried they won't be listened to or their views won't be taken seriously. Um, and it's particularly important that young people from seldom heard groups, such as those with a dis disability or young people of colour, are actively and meaningfully involved to ensure that their specific experiences are considered. Um, I would also recommend uh, taking a look at Girl in Scotland's Girls in, Girls in Scotland 2020 report, the Young Women Lead report that was mentioned earlier, and S the Scottish Youth Parliament's From Scotland's Young People manifesto to find out more about young people's views and the experiences specifically of girls and women. Okay, thank you. And finally, Alex. Um, I've just written uh, five very, very quick bullet points, and they are as much um, learnings for myself, but they might, you might find them useful as well if you're listening. Um, so one is keep learning. Two is be reflective of the diversity of the communities you're work or we are working with. Uh, speak with everyone, collaborate, and encourage empathy. Alex, thank you, and, and thank you for, for sticking to that. And I think we've got to end up there. I mean, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and making such a contribution to our panel brought to you in partnership with the Scottish Youth Parliament. I'd also like to thank our panel, Sophie Reid, Member of the Scottish Youth Parliament, Alex Borchell and Dr Ellie Cosgrave for giving up their time to take part tonight. And from, from my own personal point of view, you know, as a legislator, as a, an existing councillor, as a policymaker, I'll be in touch with all three of you because I've learned a lot tonight and I think there's lessons to be learned and the message we need to get across to all politicians, be it councillors, MSPs, MPs, or so on. So I will be in touch and take up some of these issues. I just wanted to take this opportunity to remind you that later on tonight we have the writer and environmentalist George Monbiot in conversation. And over the next four days we have debates on everything from fast fashion to a just transition, violence against women, which we've talked about tonight, diversity in politics, and climate activism, to name a few. So I do hope you can join us in these discussions. Again, a big thanks to our panelists. For you for joining in tonight and thank you very much and have a good evening. Good night.